our speaker tonight is um, David Schenker. Uh, he was a top official uh, overseeing Middle East policy in the last two years of the Trump administration. Uh, but David is unusual because he's not a career uh, foreign service officer. Um, he is a, we might call him a resident pundit um, at um, one of Washington's leading think tanks. Um, also unusual is that uh, when he uh, uh, was nominated, uh, uh, of course, somebody in the Senate is always old, holding up every nomination um, for a while for, for some personal grievance or other. <clears throat> um, he was uh, voted in 83 to 11. So it's clear that he un enjoys, uh, enjoyed and, and enjoys the respect across the political spectrum. He served uh, earlier in the George W. Bush administration as the chief uh, advisor in the, in the Pentagon on affairs in the Le Levant, uh, which, as you know, includes Syria, Iraq, and, um, and uh, Israel. Uh, his studies, he studied at the University of Vermont. He has a, a master's degree from the University of Michigan and a certificate in Arabic studies from the American University in Cairo. Uh, in between stints in government, he's been a, a senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, where he has a chair now and, uh, and is uh, writing uh, uh, regularly from there. Um, his specialties in the Middle East are uh, Lebanon, uh, Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. He's written books about, the Palest about Palestinian politics and about Jordan-Iraq uh, relations. He's the kind of expert who carries extra weight. Um, I, I speak as a journalist who's always uh, looking, looking for sources. B because his presentations uh, before Congress and, other, and, and wherever he writes uh, or, or speaks are relentlessly factual. His analysis is incisive. His logic and his understanding of the big picture are equal to anyone's, in my experience. Um, at the State Department, he supervised 9,000 staff, had a budget of $7 billion. Um, it's, that's a lot of, uh, that, that makes for a lot of sleepless nights worrying about the welfare of his staff in a volatile part of the world. Since leaving government, he has said uh, to one, in one interview that he's, he's very happy to be sleeping at night again. Um, when, when Russia sent its army into Ukraine, uh, in February, not quite two months ago. Um, it's, it sounded an alarm in so much of the world, uh, certainly here in the US and in Europe. Uh, but that apparently was not the case in the Middle East. Uh, the United Emirates, uh, United Arab Emirates, a critical uh, Gulf uh, country and a, uh, ally of the United States, um, uh, was um, abstained at the Security Council when there was a vote, the first vote condemning the invasion. <clears throat> oil prices went up, uh, but Saudi Arabia refused to boost oil production to lower, its, lower the price. Israel reportedly uh, turned down a um, request to send the Iron Dome uh, anti-missile system to Ukraine, um, which is getting battered by Russian missiles and really needs it. So everyone in that region, or almost everyone in that region, there's, there are some exceptions, is sitting on the fence. Uh, the Economist this week uh, had, had a headline in its main editorial, Get Off the Fence. And it's a good editorial. Um, David was one of the first to spot this trend. And he wrote about it in the Washington, for the Washington Institute last month. Um, and I can say that since he wrote his piece and, and pointed out the trend, it's not getting any better. The administration, the, the government of uh, Saudi Arabia has a whole slew of official media. Um, and they've now, they're, they're now almost mocking the Biden administration and uh, satirizing it. Relations with Saudi Arabia are especially in, in the decline. Uh, considering the uh, investment that the United States has made in that region, in cash, in policy, and in lives, uh, this is a worrying development. So what has gone wrong? Uh, is there any way to fix it? Um, and I turn this over to David Schenker to answer those and other questions. It's been a remarkable period of time, I think, for all of us. 
Um, and so it's great that we can all be together again. Uh, of course, I never had the, the COVID isolation. I was at the, the State Department um, when COVID hit and uh, I went to work every day and got more than 600,000 frequent flyer miles during COVID. Um, so, um, but anyway, I'm, I'm pleased to be here with you tonight and thank you so much for the kind introduction, Roy. Um, I wanna to talk tonight about our ties with the Gulf and how the Gulf sees us. And this is you know, intimately related to what's going on in Ukraine, but not, but it was going on before Ukraine. So there was a remarkable story in, um, in a, 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 a online publication called Axios um, just uh, on April 13th. And it was undoubtedly a leak from the Emiratis. But um, I want to quote a little bit from the article. So it says, um, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken apologized to Abu Dhabi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zaid, also known as MBZ, last month for the U.S. response to January's Houthi attacks against the United Arab Emirates. Two sources briefed on the issue, tell Axios. According to the two sources, Blinken admitted during his meeting with MBZ in Morocco uh, that the Biden administration took too long to respond to the attacks, and he said he was sorry. So what was the result of this? Well, when commander of CENTCOM, General McKenzie at the time, visited Abu Dhabi in February, um, MBZ, who he was supposed to meet with, refused to meet with him. Uh, because it had taken him 22 days after the, the attack to make the trip. Um, and just to give a little context, no, I think three people were killed in the attack, and they weren't Emiratis. They were um, resident workers, I think, from Southeast Asia, from India or Sri Lanka. Um, I don't know where. And this is a, a serious thing. But nonetheless, for the Emiratis, um, and you can read this, the, for the Emiratis, this was their 9-11. The fact that missiles, that drones were being fired from Yemen into um, uh, the Emirates. Um, you can imagine what would happen if a building was hit in Dubai. What happens to tourism? What happens to the economy there? What happens to investment? This is a serious thing. Right, I mean, it wasn't 3,000 or more dead in a single day, but for them, it was psychologically their 9-11. So just as an aside, um, a week after I joined the State Department, I think this was June of 2019, the Iranians attacked several ships near uh, an Emirati port called Fujira. Um, and the, within two days, I flew with the secretary to the Emirates, maybe the next day, to talk to them about what happened, to see what we could do to help defend them. The same with the, another, Iran, by the way, I didn't say, but the Houthis, the people that are firing these, uh, the, the missiles against the Emirates, they're Iranian-backed group, right? They receive all their funding, their technology, their, um, their arsenal from Iran. The same thing happened um, after an Iranian missile attack, light attack cruise missiles were fired from Iran and they were fired on the kingdom. They hit um, an Aramco facility called Abkake. Um, and they, they were perfect hits on this facility um, coming from a long way away. Um, and if the Saudis didn't have reserves that were they were ready to, to flow, um, it would have disrupted 50% of the supply coming out of the kingdom, right? So we flew to, to Saudi the next day to talk to them about what we could do, and we flew, we flowed eventually forces into the kingdom, aircraft, et cetera. But the Emiratis, maybe compared to this, they thought that the response was anemic, that it was slow. And so they were disappointed. How disappointed were they? Well, <clears throat> If you read the Washington Post, um, and I don't know this to be true, there was a report that, um, that there was a call to MBZ um, just a little while ago um, from President Biden 
um, and the call was, and MBZ is the, the crown prince, um, and that the call was refused. So the crown prince of Abu Dhabi didn't take um, the phone call from, um, from the, the, the president of the United States. So um, the Emiratis have a lot to be disappointed about. Um, uh, you know, I, I may, I'm talking sort of out of order here, but, um, you know, initially, um, when the Biden administration took office, the first act of foreign policy that they did was to uh, decline um, or actually to delist the Houthis as a terrorist organization. Now, um, this is uh, an Iranian-backed group in Yemen um, that is uh, winning a civil war there. They are routinely firing missiles and drones into Saudi Arabia, also more recently into uh, the United Arab Emirates. Um, in the last uh, few months of the Trump administration, um, the secretary asked me my opinion of this. I wrote him a memo with the pros and cons of doing so. I know there are many humanitarian organizations worried that a designation of the Houthis would um, uh, dry up humanitarian assistance and cause a famine. I understand that. Yet the first thing that the Biden administration did was to delist the Houthis as a terrorist organization. Um, Emirati frustration over this and other things that I'll talk about shortly <clears throat> led the US as uh, led the UAE as Roy said to abstain from a US UN Security Council vote on condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, Syrian uh, they also had most recently um, had welcomed uh, the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad to the UAE this is something for years the United States has been trying to isolate uh, Bashar al-Assad for basically perpetrating what resembles a genocide against the Syrian people, killing over 500,000, mostly Sunnis, and driving millions into exile. Um, that move was not, sorry, my brother. Um, uh, that move um, really blindsided the White House. They were not notified beforehand that it was going to happen. And it increased tensions, I think, with the United States. So what happened ultimately was that Anthony Blinken flew to Morocco for a meeting with Mohammed bin Zayed. Um, uh, and so we heard, um, you know, interestingly, actually, um, the meeting was not in Abu Dhabi. Right? The meeting was in Morocco. And this, uh, by regional standards, is somewhat of a slight that the Crown Prince of, of Abu Dhabi would not meet the Secretary of State in uh, in Dubai in uh, in the Emirates. And he met with him in Morocco, and issued this reported apology, which the State Department has not refuted. No, uh, they're not in a good place. I can't imagine they would refute it in any event, but um, it, it didn't happen. So the Emiratis are clearly frustrated with the administration's response to the 25th of January attack. Um, the administration actually subsequently sent a squadron of F-22s. These are the top of the line U.S. fighter jets. And they sent the USS Cole, which is an advanced uh, missile destroyer, um, off the coast of the Emirates to help defend them from these type of attacks. Um, but this is only the latest. They thought it was late. And this is only the latest in the series of, of Emirati complaints. And these complaints also include the Biden administration's efforts to return to the JCPOA, the Joint Con um, uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action on the Nuclear Agreement, right? That the Biden administration wants to agree. Um, also, the Biden administration is reticent to sell the F-35 fighter jet, the, the fifth generation most advanced US fighter jet to the Emirates. Um, and we can talk about why in a little while. I think it, there, there are decent reasons to, uh, to not sell that to the Emirates because they have a very close relationship with China. Well, how close? Well, um, the Emirati response to the US, both uh, moving toward the JCPOA again um, and um, their reticence to sell this top, top of the line US military equipment, 
the response was to go out and purchase 12 Chinese top of the line fighter jet trainers, right? And then they have an option to buy 36 more, right? Also, the Wall Street Journal reported only a couple months ago that the Chinese were constructing a military port in north of Abu Dhabi. And this is just miles away from a US Air Force base in Al Dafra um, in the UAE, which is home to the US Force's 380th Air um, Expeditionary Wing, right? So the, there's a Chinese base being built, a military base being built in the Emirates. So <laughs> the Emiratis are bent out of shape, right? They're hedging, they're concerned. But MBZ, Mohammed bin Zayed, wasn't the only Gulf leader to reject a phone call from President Biden. The Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, it was also reported that he declined to accept a phone call from the president. So before he took office, we all know that President Biden referred to MBS, as he's known, Mohammed bin Salman, as a quote unquote pariah. Right? And we can, we can go into the reasons. I knew Khashoggi. I, met, I had lunch with him three months before he was killed. Right? Nobody deserves to go into their consulate in a foreign country, uh, be murdered, be chopped up, and cooked in a tandoori oven. Right? We know that. Um, nevertheless, this is an important bilateral relations and the guy, relationship, and the guy was an, an American citizen. But he called him a pariah. Um, and this is a guy who currently is basically the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, right? Um, and Biden has refused to engage with him until he tried to make, reportedly tried to make this phone call. And probably a guy who, if nothing happens, will likely be the leader of Saudi Arabia for the next 40 years. And I believe that Jen Psaki, the White House spokesman, actually repeated this um, disparaging comment about Mohammed bin Salman and Saudi Arabia only a month ago or so, a month or two ago. Um, so the US has a commitment, by the way, to not to defend Saudi Arabia, but to provide Saudi Arabia with the equipment it needs to defend itself, among other things, against Iran. And Iran, in my view, is a uh, predatory, um, uh, aspirational, hegemonic regional power. They were at one point. They desire to be so again. And if you look at what they're doing in the region with planting militia in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, and in Lebanon, I think that sort of backs up my point. Um, but the U.S. has a commitment to do that, and yet there's, there's a concern, I think, uh, in Riyadh that we're, we're not going to do so, that we're not going to provide them with a the wherewithal to be able to defend themselves adequately. And so the Saudis, too, are annoyed and hedging. It's not just denying a phone call with the president. The Saudis concerned about whether the United States is going to provide Saudi with what, what it needs to defend itself, um, they've gone out and apparently taken steps on their own to ensure that they can defend themselves. In fact, according to the Wall Street Journal, they are cooperating with China to construct a ballistic missile factory in Saudi Arabia. Right. And so our lead ally in the Middle East, one of our lead allies, two of our lead allies, are going out and cooperating militarily in some way with China. And then to top it off, <laughs> in an interview, and I'd encourage you to read it if you haven't, because it's one of the most remarkable things, similar to the Axios um, article. But <laughs> just last month, there was an interview in MBS with Jeffrey Goldberg of the Atlantic magazine. And MBS was quoted as saying that he, quote unquote, simply did not care what President Biden thought about him. So uh, this is remarkable, right? I mean, this is Saudi Arabia, a country that we've had very important relations with for 70 years. 
the leader of Saudi, the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia. I mean, his father is King Salman, but he's an 80 year old guy. MBS is handling day to day affairs. Um, simply didn't care what the the leader of the free world thinks about him. So both of these states, their confidence in Washington and the US commitment to providing its traditional security umbrella in the Gulf it has been shaken. So why, right? It's not just these little things, right? The, re the removal of the Houthis from the terrorism list, um, being late and flowing forces or support for the UAE after they were attacked, not talking to Saudi Arabia at a senior level for a year, and just calling them when the oil prices spike as midterm elections are coming up, right? And asking Saudi and the UAE to increase production, right? So that oil prices go down or that uh, more gas can come uh, and maybe supplant the Russians um, in Europe, right? Um, these countries, and we'll get to it shortly, have other concerns, right? Why are they gonna make that type of commitment to the United States? I mean, I talked earlier about the votes, right? It's not only these countries that sort of were hesitant to take votes, and we'll talk about that more later, but there's a reason why they're concerned. So one is the pivot to Asia, right? We are, we've had for, since the Obama administration, the quote unquote pivot to Asia, I think it actually really happened under Secretary Pompeo, right? Who defined China as a strategic challenge of, of our generation, um, talked about China all the time. Me, as Assistant Secretary for the Near East in charge of the Middle East and the US government, I spent probably 25% of my time working on China related issues in the Middle East. But we are pivoting to Asia. What does that mean for our commitment to the Middle East, our presence, right? Not only our money, our troop presence, our relationships, our, our funding for our allies, our, um, our partners, et cetera. What are we gonna do to help them as we move more and more troops to Asia? So they're concerned about that. And we talk about the pivot to Asia all the time. I mean, but it's happening now. It started under the Trump administration, I think, in earnest. What do they think about the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan? Right, our partner, we were there, right? We kept the Taliban from taking over the whole country. And in the end, we left. And it wasn't so much how we, like, that we left. It was how we left, right? Uh, reminiscent of, you know, the helicopters flying us off the roofs in Vietnam just poorly organized. Now, I think smart people can disagree whether we could have accomplished what we wanted to accomplish ever in Afghanistan. I think that's a reasonable discussion. But how we left, I think there's no debate that it undermines our credibility, right? And what happened to our partners, the people that worked with us, we, we flew out 100, 50, 115,000 people, we maybe know who 15,000 of those people are. Right? They weren't the people that we worked with. It was whoever could get into the airport. That's another discussion. What, are the, what do our allies think, our partners in the region, what do they think about our, our over-reliance on economic sanctions? Right? If we got a problem, and this is inherently, we are... 6,000 miles away from the Middle East, right? We're competing with states like Iran in the Middle East. Now, Iran, in a place like Iraq, is a next door neighbor, right? They are next door, they have Shia there that they can work with that are um, amenable to uh, uh, Tehran and the vision of the world of Iran. Um, we are 6,000 miles away. If we don't like what you're doing in Iraq, and I was just the secretary, I designated dozens of people for corruption, for terrorism, for uh, a broad range of reasons. Um, if we don't like you, we're gonna designate you. If Iran has a problem with what they're doing, they're gonna kill you. Now, I don't suggest, I'm not suggesting that we do what Iran does, 
But it puts us a little bit of a disadvantage in terms of how these people view U.S. influence, particularly if you put that in the context of Afghanistan. Along with that reliance or over-reliance on sanction, we have articulated by several U.S. administrations after the Bush administration a reluctance to use military force. The right? Bush administration, we went out and killed Soleimani. That was a great thing, the head of the IRGC. Um, it broadly praised in the region. They wish that we did more of this type of thing. Um, but we don't tend to use military force, right? We are restrained, and there's a good reason for that, right? We're, we are, we've been in, involved in conflict now since 9-11, right? We just withdrew from Afghanistan. We, um, we have some 2,500 people in, in Iraq, but um, you know, we don't want to be at war. I understand that. Um, but this is not viewed in the context of Ukraine as something that is necessarily positive in the Middle East, right? In the Middle East, they see what we're doing in Ukraine and they say, ah, the Americans are perfectly willing to fight to the last Ukrainian against Russia, right? And finally, I think there is this absence of consideration of what our partner's concerns are in the Middle East, right? So the administration, the, 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 the Biden administration, and by the way, I, I think they've done, uh, I must say, I think they've done like a pretty, a very good job of keeping NATO together by and large on Ukraine and what's going on there, keeping a coalition together, um, getting people to, to arm Ukraine. I think they've done a pretty good diplomatic job on that. But um, on other issues in the Middle East, particularly in terms of what we're doing with Iran, and we'll get to this in a second in more detail, um, I think our partners, you know, we went about and the Biden administration said, we are going to consult with our partners about what we're doing with getting back into the JCPOA with our partners. We're going to do that. And they talked to the Israelis, they talked to Saudis, they talked to the Emiratis, they talked to the Bahrainis, they talked to the Omanis, talked to everybody. And yet none of these concerns seem to be t have, have been taken into account. So this was a, a consultation that was more of a listening session with no impact on what the administration was doing. Um, so, once again, they look at the first foreign policy initiative, they see the de delisting of the Houthis as a terrorist organization. It was a hard decision to make for Secretary Pompeo. He thought about it long and hard. <laughs> I sent him a memo, he said, he said, Call, like, let's talk about it after Christmas. And I came in to work the day after Christmas, and I was giving my morning intel briefing at like 7.30 in the morning, and I hadn't seen the newspaper yet. And it was widely reported uh, that day that the Houthis, that the new Yemeni government had flown to, flown to Aden, and landed at the airport, and that the Houthis sent a missile to try and kill every new member of the Yemeni government. Right, And I said to my intel briefer, I said, I, I think I know which way the secretary is going to go. <laughs> He's going to designate him today. And sure enough, he did. Um, you know, this is, by all accounts, a terrorist organization. But first thing they did, and I think to try and improve the negotiations between the Saudis and, and the Yemenis, is to remove them as a terrorist organization. They have these consultations on the JCPOA. Um, the fact that there is ongoing dialogue in the region between the Israelis and the Emiratis and the Bahrainis and others talking about how to better do missile defense or anything and do a regional security construct. And the United States seems to be absent in a way from that discussion. I think these states look around and say, where's the United States? And then on top of all of that, right, we still have this idea of a return to the nuclear agreement out there floating around. What is the remaining issue on that front? That is what the Iranians are demanding that the United States delist the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization, right? Now, if the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps is not a terrorist organization, there is no such thing as a terrorist organization. Um, and yet, the Iranians are demanding it, and the administration 
for a time appeared to be considering this because the administration wants a return to the deal more than the Iranians want a return to the deal. Because they never, after all, implemented the sanctions that were imposed on the Iranians after they took office. They let the Iranians smuggle oil. They didn't impose a penalty or secondary penalties against those who were abetting this. I could talk more about this, obviously. Um, but the idea, now, I think, you know, we can talk about what the implication of a delisting of the IRGC would be. The Quds Force is still designated. There are so many other sanctions that relate to the IRGC. It may not have a huge impact in terms of fewer US sanctions against the IRGC, um, but it's so symbolic to our partners in the region, the idea that we would remove them and politic somehow politicize this as this organization is running all these regional militias that are destabilizing all these countries that want to have better relations with the United States and to live in peace. And basically every country where there's an Iranian militia is either a failed or failing state, right? And so we're going to delist them in return for what? A potential commitment on the behalf of the Iranians that they won't attack us? What about, what of our allies and our partners in the region? So looking at this, is wondering where are we? So the result of all this, and this goes beyond just Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. This, this includes other countries too. The, the result is some hedging, right? This is hedging in the Gulf and beyond. So you have, in some countries, increasing relations with China. Now, this is a fact of life. We are no longer in you know, uh, a, a super, the United States being the only superpower. We have a multi, a multi power world. Now, we can talk about Russia's poor performance in Ukraine and basically losing to a country of however many million people, you know, and losing 3,000 vehicles, 20,000 people, 60,000, 90,000 wounded. Um, but China is a serious actor as far as I'm concerned. And the relations with China go over and above economics, right? People in the Gulf and elsewhere are doing development of things like AI, artificial intelligence, with these countries, which is the future of the battlefield, right? This is significant stuff, right? And so we've seen, in addition to moving forward with, with China, we've seen a hesitancy to confront Russia or condemn Russia for the Ukrainian invasion. Um, People didn't vote, notwithstanding the atrocities that we've seen in many uh, places in Ukraine. Um, these countries all abstained to throw Russia off the UN Human Rights Council. I mean, they eventually write it, voted the right way in the UN General Assembly, but of course this is non this is non-binding, right? This is a, a vote that costs you nothing, right? But within the Security Council, no, right? Um, so we had the refusal to throw them off the Human Rights Council. We, had, we have a refusal for years from all these states in the Gulf, Muslim countries, to condemn China for the genocide of the Chinese Uyghur Muslim population. These people are in concentration camps. This is a genocide. No condemnation. Why? We don't want to offend China. Important economic partner. These countries really don't care what happens to Muslims unless they're in Jerusalem. They, there was a refusal. I mean, beyond this, why did, why did the Biden administration, why are they working so hard now to get it back with these countries in the Gulf, right? To, to have Biden call MBS and to, after a year and a half, to have Biden call MBZ. Why are they doing that? You guys have been to a gas station lately? Right? Um, four and a half dollars a gallon. I don't know what it is up here you know, in DC. I paid you know, 410 this morning. Um, 410, five, six dollars in California. Um, when they have elections in 2022, if the oil price, if you're going and paying six dollars a gallon, um, already Biden was going to be what they call shellacked. Is that, 
uh, Obama's word, in the midterms, lose the House and the Senate. Um, you know, in, inflation, et cetera, highest since Jimmy Carter. Um, with these prices, he, he wants them to increase output. Um, well, what do we hear from these countries? What we heard is that there's a thing called OPEC Plus. Have you heard about it? This is basically OPEC, the Office of uh, the, uh, the Organization of Petroleum uh, Economic you know, Cooperation, Exporting Countries. Um, so, um, so OPEC, um, they've expanded. This was actually a great accomplishment, one of the chief dip diplomatic accomplishments of MBS to increase OPEC um, to include Russia. So OPEC plus in includes Russia. So um, basically what this administration is asking Saudi Arabia, UAE and others to do is to throw away OPEC plus, toss away this you know, agreement with Russia and side with us. Now, if you're MBS and you haven't gotten a phone call from President Biden in a year and a half and before that he only called you a pariah and his White House spokesman was calling you a pariah. Um, thought, you know, Emirates, et cetera. Why are you going to do that? Now, there's other states that are, you know, mildly, mildly hedging as well. But they won't break. So before I go there, they won't break with Russia. They've already indicated they're not going to break with Russia to increase supply. And if they did, whether it would be enough to lower oil prices significantly is unknown. Right, it's pretty, pretty tight in terms of what their capacity is, um, what they could release, et cetera, given the demands, right? And you, there's certainly, a lot of countries are not gonna release more natural gas, and it may not be out there anyway to release, but to you know, offset um, what's happened with, with Europe and try and deny Russia uh, sales to Germany. Um, but it, you should know, and you've already seen that the Biden administration went to Venezuela to go talk to them about getting, being able to sell their oil, their oil freely. So there, there's really a shaken confidence. But there's other states out there that are hedging as well. So until recently, the Egyptians were about to buy the Su-30, Su-35 fighter jets, which is top of line four plus generation fighter jet from Russia, and they agreed to buy them. And I think they got them and then didn't like them, and so they're not going to take delivery of the full thing, but they would have been sanctioned potentially by the United States Congress for buying these things, much like Erdogan in, in Turkey was sanctioned for buying the S-300 uh, top-of-line Russian, S-400 top-of-line Russian air defense system. Um, likewise, Israel, in the very beginning, after the invasion, um, the day after the invasion, the, uh, I think the Prime Minister of Israel issued a statement supporting, not condemning the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, but supporting the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And it was only after the United States went and beat on Israel that they released a statement. The foreign minister said, we condemn the invasion. Prime Minister has condemned human rights violations in Ukraine, but he hasn't said who perpetrated them. Now, the Israelis have another reason for doing this. Syrian airspace is controlled by Russia, and, and Israel is bombing Iranian targets in Syria every other day. So they want to have continued access. They're in a tough position. N nevertheless, everybody is hedging a little bit about this. And we want everybody to condemn these guys, cut them off economically, the Russians, et cetera, on their hedging. And for the first time ever, I read today, it was announced that Israel has added the Chinese yuan to its currency holdings. They never, ever had yuan as holdings for the Central Bank of Israel or whatnot. So is there a silver lining here? There is. As an incredibly optimistic presentation, but um, if anything, what we're seeing with the 
concern about the United States, we're, we're seeing actually Israel and other Arab states getting closer, right? Um, UAE, Bahrain, even quietly, probably Saudi Arabia. And that's because they believe that they're going to have to go it alone vis-a-vis -vis Iran, that we're not going to be there for them because we're going to sign a deal with them, maybe. And after we sign a deal, we're certainly not going to do anything to push back on other behavior of Iran in the region. So these states are getting together and they're doing what they feel is necessary and designing their own security architecture in the region. So what do we do about this, right? Fewer resources, more focus on Asia. Um, how, do you, how do you square the circle here, right? Um, you know, every administration comes into office and says they can walk and chew gum at the same time. I've never seen it, right? Um, you get overwhelmed by crises and you can't handle these sort of second, what, what because they're not crises, a second tier issue. Well, I think to start off with, this administration in a way is gonna have to eat some crow, right? They call themselves the Human Rights Administration and that's fine rhetorically, but there's nothing more than rhetorical with that in this administration, like so many other administrations. Um, Saudi Arabia is a reality. They're an important partner of the United States. Um, in any event, you know, a country like the Emirates, they don't have bragging rights on human rights. Right? The human rights across the region are not distinguished. Right? Um, so um, I think we have to be a little bit realistic here. And we press people quietly, um, leverage foreign assistance where we can, uh, but also recognize we're in a tough spot here and we have to compete with China and with Russia in these countries. And so we could be, I think, smarter about it, about how we approach these issues. Um, I wrote an article with a colleague of mine uh, in the Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago about how we can better sell weapons in the Middle East. Um, we don't sell or co-produce with a lot of countries in the Middle East. Um, we limit what they can have. Um, these people can have other options. These countries have other options. We have to decide um, that um, if we sell a country a certain widget, um, that it might prevent them from buying another widget and maintain closer con contacts with the United States, provided they don't go to China, provided they're reliably not Chinese or Russian oriented. Um, we got to think about how to do these kind of things. Lastly, I don't think it serves us um, to be insulting these countries. We don't get anything for it. Um, like I said, I knew Khashoggi, he was a good guy, right? I mean, he was no saint, right? Nobody deserves to be murdered by their, their government. Um, but these relationships are perhaps bigger than this. Um, and we have to look at um, you know, what our interests are, um, a multipolar world, and decide how to best navigate that. Um, when I was in government, I would always tell my mom, um, the choices aren't between good and bad. The choices are between bad and worse. And we gotta choose the bad over the worse. Um, I support human rights. I talk to people in all these countries about human rights. Um, but whether I wanna pound them so hard, um, we gotta think about how we calibrate our leverage, our pressure and look at our, our interests across the board. And so this is a tough issue. There's no easy answers to this, um, but we have to work harder on these countries in the Gulf, even as we shift other resources elsewhere. So with that, um, thank you very much. Maybe I can throw in a question here just on Ukraine, following up on Ukraine. <clears throat> what would happen in the Middle East what would be the impact in the Middle East were the Russians to lose in Donbass? I mean, not, not get Mariu Mariupol, um, maybe have a, a, you know, more huge losses, <clears throat> more setbacks. Um, and it's sort of inconceivable to most of us, but still it's been, it's what happened in north of uh, Kiev. What, what's the, what would be the impact? Would they still be a great power uh, 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 and, and have all this influence in the Middle East? 
Well, I'm, I'm not a Russia specialist by any by any uh, stretch of the imagination, um, but I I think that um, you know certainly um, you know Russia um, back in 2013 um, really asserted itself in a way that it has in the Middle East since they were thrown out of Egypt by Amr Sadat before the you know uh, before the 73 war. Um, you know, it had been a pillar of U.S. policy since, you know, 1972 and 73 to keep the Russians out of the Middle East. That all changed with President Obama, who welcomed the Russian um, military deployment to Syria because he said, oh, they'll have a quagmire, right? And uh, it's great. And, and with 40 fixed-wing aircraft, they... And all the barrel bombs that they helped drop on the civilian populations in Syria helped change the course of the war. And of course, Assad won in the end. Um, uh, and they've since interfered in Libya to great effect with their Wagner mercenaries, et cetera. Um, I think people look at how Russian weaponry has performed in, in Ukraine and the Middle East and say, I'm not sure I want to go out and buy Russian armor. Right, <laughs> you know, it, it, we're probably going to have decreased Russian armor sales. I'm not sure the same is true of Russian aircraft because they did perform, I think, beyond expectation in Syria. Um, but you know, the defeat of Russia. I think if Russia doesn't win decisively, it's a defeat, right? Um, and I think everybody has been rethinking Russian power after losing three thousand tanks and armored personnel carriers. Losing twenty thousand personnel, um, six, you know, ninety thousand probably, or what, uh, sixty thousand wounded. Um, I think, uh, and general officers. yeah, seven or eight general officers killed so far, or more. Um, I think you know people are starting to think about you know what Russia brings. Um, you know, it, Russia doesn't have an economy, as, a, as people say. Uh, Russia is a is a gas station, right? And they can't sell gas. Um, but one thing they do have going for them is they tend to stand by their allies. Um, and uh, that's not something that uh, we're distinct. Well, I mean, you know, certainly, uh, you know, Heftar in, in Libya has been, a, you know, a, a partner or an ally. I think um, uh, in the region, I think, uh, you know, uh, they're willing to stand by. Their partners, but uh, they listen. They they have um, been willing to sell all kinds of countries, all all kinds of equipment, um, and it may be that. Um, well, how many do they have? Um, I think they're viewed like China that they will, you know, be there if you need them. That they don't care about international resolution. Syria is certainly a great example of that. I think they have stood by Iran. Uh, in a way, in terms of protecting them at the UN, in terms of backing them at the five plus one in the negotiations. Um, so they got three, four allies in the, in the region, but they are steadfast. And they have changed the course of history in at least one or two of those countries. Um, there was a lot of discussion with the prior administration about how the State Department was uh, gutted with talent and uh, my, so my question is, do you see that being repaired now? And do you see that as part of um, probably the, the, a critical part of the problem in, in the Middle East with our relationships that that strength is uh, diminished? You know. Actually, they brought in some new talent also. <laughs> Yeah, listen, I didn't see that. Like, there were people that left when Trump came in because they didn't want to work for President Trump. Um, they didn't agree with the worldview, or they retired early. These are people that had been one-term, you know, one-term ambassadors. And you know, if you're lucky, you have people that serve three, four. Although there's not enough ambassadorships, right? And it's good to get other younger talent to these positions as well. Um, I didn't experience that in NEA in the East Affairs Bureau where I worked. Um, you know, I know there was a lot about Yovanovitch getting, getting fired. Um, I said, I worked for Pompeo. I think Pompeo went to bat for her. I think um, he, you know, basically 
um, kept her in her position. And then President Trump asked her about her again, and she had three months left on her tour. And, you know, and he removed her and gave her another job in the U.S. government. Um, and she, if she had stayed in, she probably would have gotten another ambassadorship. Um, I, you know, I didn't see this across the board. Um, uh, you know, I, I valued the expertise of my counterparts, my colleagues in the State Department. Um, I had them serving as my deputies. I advanced their careers. Um, I think very highly of them. I, thought, I think a lot of people left early, um, not necessarily forced out but didn't want to work for that uh, administration. Um, but um, no, I, I don't think that happened across the board. I think one of the problems actually, and this is um, dealing with somebody who came from private industry, Rex Tillerson, never worked in the government, um, as well as President Trump. He said, you know, at one point they said, well, you know, you get 4,000 political appointees in administration. And these are anybody from like a secretary in an office who worked on the campaign who's 23 years old um, to, you know, other people that are assistant secretaries or undersecretaries. I, I didn't do anything on the campaign. I didn't give any money. Um, but um, they have 4,000. Um, and when President Trump came in he, from industry, he says, well, why do I need all these people? The government's already too big. Where am I going to hire 4,000 people? Tillerson says, well, we already have too many. We have 60,000 people in the State Department. Why do we need that many? Right? Why do we have to hire more people? I don't think they understand. Um, I don't think they understood exactly that policy is people. It's having your people in the right place that either share a worldview. I, and, and I shared a worldview with Pompeo in the Middle East. And I think he got it right. Um, you know, pushing back on Iran, pushing back on China, um, you know, uh, you know, pushing peace um, in the in the region between Arabs and Israelis. Um, but if you don't have these people that are empowered, are willing to take risk, if you are a foreign service officer, you're going to stick your neck out on these kind of issues and not get your next assignment. I, it's it's hard. So I don't think they hired the people. And I think it was wrong, and I think they got started late staffing up. Um, this administration, too, is late staffing up, and in part that's because of Congress, right? Um, and there's a Democratic Congress, right? Um, they can't even get their own people. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's complicated. But no, I, I think, listen, I think State Department has a number of issues. Um, people talk about morale in the State Department. You tell me, you're going to bid on a job, a new job every three years. Right? Um, a lot of times, you're not going to get that job. Right? You're not going to get your first choice. You're not going to get your second choice. Um, and it's not because you're not qualified, but maybe because the department would be better served if you were elsewhere. Right? People make these decisions. The process, until now, has never been transparent. Right? Right? So you don't know why you didn't get that job. Right? Um, you may have to go to Iraq for a year or two. Right? Your family ain't coming with you. Right? Now, people say the morale is bad in the State Department. It's not because of the Trump administration. I think that it's a very difficult place to work, to be a foreign service officer. It's a tough job. Now, there are people who serve in Europe. That's great. <laughs> there are other people who go from Beirut to, um, you know, to Baghdad, un unaccompanied posts. You don't see your kids except for on vacation once or twice a year. Right? It's not an easy thing. Or your spouse. Right? And a lot of people in the State Department are tandems. That is two diplomats that are married to each other. How are you going to get even close to each other or the same embassy? You can't work for your spouse. You got to be in a different place. It's a hard place to work. So listen, I think I just take it with a grain of salt. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I did, I really, I tried to work on diversity and inclusion in the State Department um, because I, I said on day one that I think the State Department should look like the, the United States. We are a colorful place, right? But how do you tell somebody who's LGBTQT to go work in Egypt where these people are persecuted and arrested? And how do you tell them to go work there with their spouse? Right? It's, 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 it's a whole, you know, it's very, it's not so simple. And I don't think it's, you know, listen, I, I know Pompeo took a whole bunch of hits on Yovanovitch. I, I think he did what he could. Um, and I think overall, I, 
you know, I tried to do my best for these people. I think they're great Americans. Uh, last, uh, last question from our Zoom audience. Uh, the last question we have for you tonight is, what do you think of Turkey's position on the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Um, well, you, you, you know, so what do you think of, of uh, Turkey's position on the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Um, you know, fortunately, when I worked in the Aries Affairs Bureau and even um, at the Washington Institute, um, Turkey was not defined as part of the Middle East. Um, so I didn't have to didn't have to work on it. Although it had been uh, until 1973 in the Near East Affairs Bureau at the State Department, um, I was in Turkey about a month ago, and uh, you know it, they're in an interesting position. So they have you know uh, have sent uh, have armed Ukrainians with this uh, Bayraktar drone which uh, has proved impervious to jamming, uh, is relatively easy to operate, and has had great operational successes in, in Ukraine. And that's great. Um, Turkey's in a, a difficult position, right? Their, their leading tourism industry is the Russians first, Ukrainians second, right? They're not going to have a good year this year, I can't imagine. Um, you know, and their economy is already terrible, right? Which is why I think in part they have you know, strive to uh, improve relations with the United States and Israel, among others. Um, they have, uh, I believe it's the Montreux Convention, have, um, uh, you know, filed Article 19 and not allowed additional Russian warships uh, into, uh, into the Black Sea, um, which has been a very positive development. Um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, easy for us to ask them to do more. Um, uh, but they, they are the neighbor. They are the front line with Russia. Uh, they are the ones who shot down a Russian uh, you know, aircraft um, over the Syrian-Turkish um, border. Um, they had to deal with the consequences of that. Um, they feel, you know, because they are estranged in a way from the United States right now, because of Katz's sanctions, et cetera, um, a little vulnerable. Um, but I think they're doing the right thing. Um, and I think and I hope that this opens new possibilities for um, closer relations and a, a, a repair of the very damaged relations with with Washington uh, that have um, you know been ongoing for some time. Thank you. So, as as I said in my introduction, uh, David is relentlessly factual, incisive in his analysis, and has a big a view of the world that is as solid as anybody's. So we thank you for tonight. Thank you so much. And thank the audience.